My people, my people, we're ready to mount up like a eagle. Stand and fight against evil. A system rigged and deceitful. Welcome to the King Talk Podcast, where we're all about truth, community, and discussing the things you care about, because we care about you. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Coleman. And today we're back at you with our third installment of Table Talks, where myself and the brothers from King chop it up about topics inspired by our previous guest interview and any other relevant issues we may want to throw on the table. Last week, we had Sergeant Edwin Raymond on the podcast, who's the NYPD sergeant. Uh, He's part of the NYPD 12 class action suit that is suing the department for unjust arrest quotas that target minority communities. And he's also the organizer of the Cops for Kaepernick movement. Now, in today's table talk, it gets real. We talk about what the Cops for Kaepernick movement means, whether or not black and black crime is the real issue, and whether or not we're paying enough attention to black on black violence. And we also get into what potential reforms should be implemented to address police brutality. Now, the table didn't agree on all points, so this made for a really good discussion. But that's what it's all about, though. Put it on the table and let's talk about it. So enjoy today's episode, and don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and YouTube. And for my iTunes users out there, don't forget to rate us five stars. All right, y'all. So we back at the table again, man. You know how we do with table talks. Uh, definitely about to chop it up about this interview with uh, Edwin Edwin Raymond, Sergeant Edwin Raymond, and just so much to chew on there. So we got my man uh, Chris Broussard in the building. What's going on there, brother? What's happening, man? I'm doing great. And you know we got my man back, Cliff Means. Hey, what up, what up, what up? Good to be with you, man. I ain't got a nickname for you this week, man. I'm going to leave you alone, man. Maybe yeah, I can't, I'm going to come, you know. <laughs> come back with another one. You and your nickname, Big Money, I'm going to come back with it next week, you know. I can't live up to big. You know my nickname when I was a kid was uh, Cliff J. Cliff they J, They called okay. me Cliff J for the jump shot. Oh, no, I don't I believe that. I, uh, yeah. I, 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 had <laughs> hey, I had a smooth jumper. Now, I, I can see Cliff hands, B. Though. Right. Cliff B for the bench. Oh, <laughs> oh snap! Shot you fire. know Chris oh, fire. Fire. Cliff J. Hey, nah. <laughs> <laughs> but I... Alright, fellas. So you know, um, I have to say, man, you know this this Edwin Raymond interview. Certainly, I think is probably the most serious content that we've covered so far here at King Talks. You know, powerful interview uh, for our listeners out there who have, who didn't hear. It, you definitely got to go back and check it out. Um, but, you know, so Edwin Raymond, this this sergeant, you know, from New York, who's part of the NYPD 12, uh, is part of this class action suit against the NYPD in regard to unlawful arrests and so forth, arrest quotas. Um, you know, he's he's organized the Cops for Kaepernick rally. You know, um, I want to throw this at you guys. You know, what are, what would you say are the implications of such a demonstration with this Cops for Kaepernick rally? And what larger statement do you think cops rallying behind Ka- Colin Kaepernick makes? Chris, I'm, I'm going to holler at you on that one. What are your thoughts on that? For me, cops for Kaepernick, I mean, I think it's tremendous. It's just like the impact of having the veterans for Kaepernick. You know, when you hear an Army or a military veteran speak out for Kaepernick and say, look, this is what I am fighting for. So he has the freedom to choose to not stand for the national anthem or the freedom to you know, speak his mind on what he sees as injustices in the uh, society, I think that lends more credibility to Kaepernick. And so I think it's the same thing with the cops for Kaepernick. It shows you, if anybody's looking at this objectively, it would show you, you know what, he's not anti-cop. If cops are supporting him, then he is not anti-cop. And let's not let that supposed narrative distract us from the real essence of what he's saying which is there's injustice in our criminal justice system so that's number one i also think it leads credibility to what he's saying or lends credibility to what he's saying because if you have policemen who you know are backing this guy then that shows i mean they know better than anybody they know better than kaepernick 
if the system is unjust right. or just. And they're backing him. So they're saying, no, he's right. It is unjust. And so I think that it's tremendous all the way around for these policemen to support Colin Kaepernick. And I also think it shows that it shows all people, but black people in particular, that there are certain things that are more important than you just going along to get along. Like I think, exactly. you know, there are some things that it might cost you your job. It might cost you your reputation among those that you work with among your colleagues. But there are certain certain things like standing up for your people, standing up for what's right and wrong, standing up against injustice that you you must do if you're a man. And so I think mm-hmm. all of us can learn from that. And I know with me, that's one of the things that gives me boldness is when I look at my heroes like Frederick Douglass and the way they were willing to stand up and take a risk for what they believed and what was right and and specifically for for the rights of their people. And so I think Edwin Raymond doing that should be a lesson for all of us that we can use as inspiration to do the same thing. You know, I'm going to come back on that too. I'm going to get you guys get get you guys thoughts on this um you know, nobody wants to be a traitor. You know, nobody wants to be a traitor to their race. You know, police officers don't want to be a traitor to the Blue Shield, you know. And I think that what happens is, I think we almost, it's like we kind of sanitize history sometimes. Like, in, in a sense, like, you know, we people always bring up Martin Luther King. You know, it's kind of like the model protester and, and you know, advocate for civil rights. But, I mean, shoot, black people was hating on him, too. At least in the North. In you know the what I'm saying? Or too. even in yeah, the his, South. His like his once he started getting on the right. Yeah, once he started getting on the right. Vietnam War, they didn't want him to deal with that. They didn't want him to deal with necessarily the poor man's march. They wanted to kind of, they wanted to keep him pigeonholed on race issues. And they were hating on him as well. You know what I mean? Like we look back on him as being as beloved as he was. But I guess my thing is like, you know, and, and maybe this goes to your point, Chris, like, you know, that willingness to be um uh hated or just kind of you know margin marginalized by the people, the very people that you're standing for, you know, maybe it kind of speaks to that. Like, what, what do you guys think I about think that? Right on the money. I mean, right. Jesus Christ was hated on by the people he came to. He came to save his own and his own received him not. Martin Luther King was not nearly as popular, even among black folks, as we would seem to think today. Um, and certainly not amongst white Americans. Um, so a lot of times, most people of all, of any race are going to go along to get along. Mm -hmm. That's what most people are going to do. That's why culture is important. That's why, you know, the way your society is going, um, is important because a lot, most people are going to get caught up and swept up into that racism and slavery is a prime example. You know, most whites just went with the flow of Jim Crow segregation, of lynching African-Americans, of all the discrimination. They just went with the flow. It takes, in a lot of ways, it takes people who are really, you know, firmly committed to God and committed to truth to stand up and say, I'm not going with the flow. Right. And I think you miss opportunities to to create change. Like one of like one of my favorite parts of the Edwin uh, Raymond interview is when he talked about how, you know, obviously Colin Kaepernick was wearing the pig socks. And, you know, he had that conversation with him about that. And, and you know, to this day, you know, uh, Sergeant Raymond says that the number one question that he gets from other officers is how can you support somebody who wears these pig socks, you know, depicting, you know, police officers as pigs. He said, but, you know, he's been able to, you know, open dia- dialogue, you know, with some of these officers and upon having that, that, that dialogue, they're able to say, OK, well, you know, well, we see where you're coming from, you know. And so many times I hear from people that, oh, well, these protests aren't doing anything. They're just causing trouble. But I do think that you, at least in some cases, have these dialogues that otherwise may not have occurred. You know, but it it, it, it all begins with taking time to say, you know, I'm just going to I'm going to stand for something you know that's right, regardless of how it's viewed by, by others. I think a lot of people aren't concerned whether it's causing good or not. I mean, you hear a lot of people say, why doesn't Kaepernick give money, you know, give all the money that he's making, give it away to charity. Then they hear he's giving it to charity and then it's on to the next thing. You know, why didn't he give his whole salary to charity? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how much uh, progress is really a goal of the people who who don't care for what he's doing. 
what I appreciate as far as the, the parallels, both of them are black men who are standing up in organizations that are dominated by white men, you know, like football and, and, and police departments are like ground zero for white male toxicity and privilege. You know what I'm saying? Like those are good well, old what, boy networks. It, it, what is it? <laughs> What yeah, what well, organization, what what field of endeavor in America? Well, is I think it? some I think some organizations have more. I think we're doing all right in the NBA. We we're making moves in the NBA. I well Yeah, no. but it's, <laughs> but like, it's still I mean yeah, obviously for, yeah. It, yeah, I mean twenty nine of the 30, 30 owners are white. Right, I'm just right, saying right. some organizations have more of a female presence for more of a female influence from the top ideologically in their organizations in corporate America, you have more of it. Uh, but in football and the police departments, those are places where it's like the last place where they just have their way and they don't want any kind of accountability. So I think for them to stand, it takes a, t- it t- look, it takes courage to stand up anywhere, but for them to stand up in those organizations, I take, I think takes it, an extraordinary amount of, of of courage. And you mentioned some earlier, Chris, about, you know, veterans for Kaepernick. And it brings me to mind, like, just how when people, when they complain about players kneeling during the national anthem, most of the time they are not viewing this through the perspective of Black veterans. People who have served in the military come back home and been killed by police or experienced racial injustice. You take... Uh, Walter Scott and the cop, uh, I think his name last name was Sledger. Slager, um, yeah. yeah, Slager. Both of them were served in the U.S. Coast Guard. Like they were both U.S. Coast Guard servicemen. And just look at the irony of that for them to at one time be brothers in battle and now be at home <laughs> and their enemies. And here's what it's a perfect picture of the 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 binary experience of an African American serving this country. I mean, my own father dressed in his uniform before going to Vietnam, went into a restaurant, fully dressed in Baltimore and would not be served. He stood there for two minutes and the woman just ignored him. And eventually a white guy came up to him and said, young man, I apologize, but they're not going to be serving you at this restaurant. And he said, it's a shame because they're probably going to send you off to Vietnam. And like... What do you think somebody like my dad feels when he sees Colin Kaepernick kneel? Do you think he feels disrespected? <laughs> like, no, he doesn't feel disrespected. He's like, this is somebody who's who's giving me a voice as well. It's not just veterans, it's black veterans whose voices aren't heard in this. Yeah, you know, many times it seems like the, the conversation never progresses past you know, the protest, you know, quote, that supposedly a protest against the flag or against the national anthem, you know, but, you know, sometimes people do venture past it. And, you know, many folks, both black and white, uh, say that unarmed blacks are killed at a higher rate uh, than whites because blacks commit more violent crimes and are therefore more likely to have violent encounters with the police. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, Chris, I'm, I'm going to holler at you on that. But what are your thoughts on that? The proof that that statistic is not uh, the reason that we are being discriminated against by police officers is in the history and in the current landscape of criminal justice in America. Number one, slavery. Uh, were we doing anything negative for whites to decide that they wanted to enslave us? No, it was it had nothing to do with our actions. It was just them deciding that they wanted to enslave African people uh, to make money. Uh, and to have a better life for themselves. And so that was not based on our behavior. Um, The war on drugs. Are we the ones who are disproportionately by a wide margin uh, being locked up in prison for drug use or drug selling because we do it more than white folks? No. The statistics show that all across the races, basically everybody uses drugs the same amount. We're 13% of the population. We're 14% of those who use and sell drugs. Uh, But we're disproportionately uh, roughly 74% of those sent to prison for drug crimes. Uh, 35% of those arrested for drug crimes. Um, And so the war on drugs is a war on black and Hispanic and poor white people. 
the, the war on drugs is focused in the hood. Not because there's more drugs in the hood, but because there's black people and poor people in the hood. If you really had an, uh, an unbiased war on drugs, then the cops would be hitting the college campuses just as much as they hitting the projects. Because we all know that drugs are rampant on our college campuses. We all know that drugs are rampant in the suburbs. But they're not, they're not going after the drug use in the suburbs, in the corporate world, and in the, on the college campuses like they are in the hood. So that shows you again, that has nothing to do with us doing more crime. That has to do with the color of our skin. And then finally, the police shootings. Um, certainly, there are times when they may be accidents, when a cop might be scared for their life. They're in a tough situation and they, they, they kill somebody, you know. But we have seen too many. You know, John Crawford walking in a Walmart with a toy gun, shot down. Tamir Rice playing with a toy gun like I played with a toy gun as a kid. Like I'm sure all of us probably did at one time or another. Shot down within two seconds. You know, just a 12-year-old boy. You know, Terrence Crusher with his hands up in the air. Just shot down. And Philando Castile with a baby and his girlfriend in the car. Telling the cops, I got a car. I got a gun. Now, I, I got a gun. I'm not reaching for it. And so these are, there's too many examples of us being killed or discriminated against or oppressed by white authority that has nothing to do with our behavior for us to buy into the narrative that, oh, it's y'all behavior that is messing you up and getting you shot and getting you killed. So no, I'm not buying that at all. Right. Exactly. I mean... When you look at even the numbers, I mean, 70 percent. I mean, and, and again, keep in mind, the numbers are hard to keep track of just because the FBI up until this past year is just now starting to actually keep an accurate track of police killings. I mean, up until now, the FBI allowed police departments to voluntarily submit information. They were not obligated to to submit information about the number of homicides that were committed uh, in the department by police officers, but now because of organizations like the Washington Post and the Guardian who having more accurate numbers, I mean, I think it was 2014 or 2015 where the FBI had enlisted that there were only 444 killings. Guardian went and did their work by pulling together media clippings and news reports and came up with 1,200 killings. <laughs> so like that's the the amount of disparity we're talking about in, in what the FBI had versus what um, these news organ you talking about news organizations with more accurate information than the FBI. So if we're talking about interactions with, with police officers or, or uh, with, with minorities in dangerous communities, one majority of them, majority of them are unarmed. Second, there's also been studies that have shown that the number of killings have no correlation with the actual crime in the area. So some of, the, your, some of your most dangerous cities, some of your most dangerous areas actually don't have your, the most police killings. So there's, there's variable rates that show that police killings actually have a lot more to do with the practices of the department than they do with the crime in the area. And then you take somebody like a Philando Castile, Here's somebody who had been pulled over by the p police over 50 times in a few years span, 50 times, by all accounts was a model employee, a legal gun owner, somebody who had taken classes about how to actually interact with police in a civil way. I mean, this is a dude that basically did everything you're supposed to do. And it's demonstrated from the video. You can see yep. in the video that he's expressing to the officer and trying to implement practices that he's been taught as to how to communicate with officers. And he still gets killed because of the irrational fear that officers have. And look, keep in mind, these are not just white officers. And this is where a lot of people get off because they think that this is just a conversation about white people killing blacks or white officers killing black people. It has more to do with a white supremacist ideology that Many people embrace, many cops embrace black, white, Hispanic. If you look at the percentages, 
Hispanics kill blacks at the highest rate. Blacks are second and whites are third. If you look at the percentages, now granted, white officers kill the most because they make up the majority of the departments. But percentage wise, officers of all different colors are killing unarmed black men. So we have to recognize that the ideology and the thought process that goes into implicit bias and seeing poor black people. So poor whites, they're not they don't get value the way that they should. They experience a form of injustice. But then when you combine poverty with race, then you top it off with mental illness in many cases. That's like a three course meal for injustice. You know what I'm saying? And so. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm definitely not buying it like Chris. And I think, you know, people have to look in deeper and look at the holistic picture before coming to a shallow conclusion like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a tough issue, man, because you have different communities, you know, trying to grapple with, you know, the same problem. And, you know, with that here and what you what you uh, were saying, Cliff, is the word skepticism comes to mind. You know, mm. um, African-Americans, I think it's fair to say, are very skeptical of you know the powers that be you know or and and police officers and so forth and then reason. i think you have uh white americans are skeptical of african americans in these situations they you know Facts. they feel they come to this situation with a presupposition that th- this african american or person of color must have done something wrong you right. know whereas an african american is going to approach it and say well no i you know i presuppose that these cops they do stuff all the time i had a cousin this happened to or this happened to me and so we come with these different you know, skepticisms, I guess you could say. And we're trying to have a conversation and build on it and find a way out. But if we don't deal with these with these um, presuppositions, I, I think it just yeah. makes it that much more difficult. Trust is totally and, um, broken, yeah. Trust is broken, absolutely. I absolutely. mean, you look at the way that whites are policed for the most part, like they should, like you should be policed. Yep. Like all mm-hmm. people should be policed. They are given the benefit of the doubt. Right. They are they are dealt with with compassion. Right. Um, you look at the op- opioid epidemic now. There you go. The president the you president it. declares it a national crisis or an emergency state of emergency. <laughs> health, a health yeah. crisis. A yeah. health crisis. Yeah. Did they do that with crack? Nope. Nope. They just lock brothers up. Yeah. They. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they they're not trying again. to. They're not like trying to lock people up with this opioid epidemic. Nope. They're trying to give people help. And that's the way it should be. But that's the way it should have been with crack. Exactly. And and, and now how many families were destroyed? How many black kids now are growing up without parents or without a father, you know, or or growing up with with a father who was in prison? Right. You know, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. of the way the government chose to respond to the crack epidemic versus the way they're. Responded to the opioid epidemic. Chris said crack. Yeah, we, crack. He I was mean, yeah, he hit that crack hard. But we, we, I mean, we were watching. Wait, wait, wait we you said he hit that crack hard. Wait, you might want to rephrase that, bro. <laughs> I can vouch. I never have smoked crack in my life. <laughs> Chris, don't play with his C's. But um, right. I mean, you know, we used to sit around the television and celebrate cops, the show cops. I mean, like cops were seen as heroes going into a foreign land to subdue an enemy. I mean, that's literally how cops were treated. It was like a military mission to go and subdue the foreign power, who in this case was inner city America, America's problem. We are protecting you from these people. And we Mm -hmm. sat around both black and white and watched it and celebrated it. And it was all part of a political brainwashing that took place that now, thank thank goodness for works like the New Jim Crow and the 13th that have shown us it was part of a media and political push. But yeah, I mean it's it's that that is a that right there is an injustice. And I think the backlash that officers are experiencing now where they're no longer being celebrated as heroes. Look, of course we should appreciate officers for the sacrifice that they make, mm-hmm. but calling accountability Uh, for what's been going on in our hoods and not treating our neighborhoods like they are war zones to be uh, to to put down the 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 blue flag, so to speak. Uh, We got to move on from that. And I think people are waking up to it. And and obviously there's a resistance to it. You know, what I think is fascinating, man, and it's going back to one of your earlier points that, you know, if 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 there are police practices such as, you know, what uh, Edwin Sergeant Edwin Raymond described, 
you know, I can't generalize and say that it's a na- nationwide thing. I don't have any statistics to show that, but if I those think, types of I things are going broken on, windows policing is uh, is very common. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That, that's without question. That's without yeah. question. Yeah. Now, if you have these types of things going on, and let's say you know officers are arresting folks or or accosting people based upon a, a quota system or what have you, then you know to the earlier question, then you have police officers interacting with people of color. Uh, for reasons that are independent from the crime rate, as as you mentioned exactly. earlier, you know what I'm saying. Exactly. So yeah. it's it. So when people say, "Oh, well, there's more crime going on in these areas, and therefore you're going to have these more interactions," well, there may be some truth to that. But then you have this other element that you right. wouldn't necessarily expect to see show up in the statistics. You see what yep. I'm saying? The statistics you're creating crime. <laughs> you're creating crime, exactly. right? Exactly. That's exactly right. what what Sergeant Raymond was saying. Right. Exactly. I mean, you see a you see a young black male in the hood walking around with a backpack, and the police officer just goes up to him and wants to see what's in the backpack. Right. And then you know, he, he, Edwin even told me when I spoke with him, um, I, I I can't remember quite if he said this on the interview, but he said that you know if the black kid, you know is is isn't really giving the police officer a problem the police officer can el- escalate the situation yes, himself yes. he said that yeah to the sure, point where the young get kid arrest. gets frustrated you know right. and right. and and then he starts acting up and then you can get him for you know resisting arrest or whatever it may a be a bunch of different little and charges. you create yeah. yeah you create a crime well, I can give you an example you know, of that. Matter of fact, I mean, as a social worker, um, I, I spent a great deal of time working with at risk youth, right? And uh, I've had some of my clients come tell me, you know, uh, usually the teenagers, they'll say that when they're on, you know, playing basketball or something like that, let's say if it's an area where officers know that, uh, you know, the, a particular gang, like say the Bloods, for example, tend to, you know, inhabit a particular area, sometimes police officers will approach them and say, yo, what's cracking? Now, to us, that didn't really sound like anything. If you say that to somebody who, you know, if you use the term cracking, you know, you're talking to a blood, that's considered to be something threatening because that's something that a, that a crip would say. You see what I'm saying? And so they know the lingo and they use this lingo to antagonize, to kind of see, you know, how these young brothers are going to respond. So these type of things, they, they do happen, you know, and I think that unfortunately, those are the kind of things you would expect to show up in the statistics. Uh, but it's a reality that I think right. that uh, unfortunately, you know, not enough people are, are um are, are paying enough attention to. Um, I want to get you know get you guys' perspective on how you guys respond. I mean, obviously, you have a lot of people out here talking about how you know we have these large protests against police brutality, and you know their angle is you know why protest about police brutality when you got black on black crime? It's like we hear that all the time. You know, what about mm-hmm. black on black crime? You know, it's a, it's right. a much bigger problem. Why don't y'all deal with that? You know, how do you guys come back at that in terms of you know the, the black on black crime defense? Let me, so let to me speak? talk about that one real quick. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So that first of all, we had let's let's stay off the rip. Obviously, when they, when we say black on black crime, we understand that both groups, white, black, all groups commit crime mostly against the same race. So we understand that. But say this that again, because most people don't seem to know that well i think it's been repeated enough over the last two years that hopefully people understand that that most groups commit crime within their within their own groups whites kill whites at an 80 85 percent clip i believe blacks kill blacks indians kill indians people kill people they're familiar with yeah you kill who you're around right who you're around on large domestic violence issues like that inner you know intercultural abuse but granted Black people kill one another at a higher rate. So we do have a violence problem in our communities uh, that many Black people are dealing with every single day and trying to address and dealing with. But the question is for many of these people is, hey, you know, why are you giving so much attention to it? Well, it's simple. Today, God, you know, our prayers go out to the people in New York. We had a terrorist attack that went down in the city, and I believe... A pra- at this point, we believe uh, about six people were killed. And so obviously our prayers go out to their families. But tomorrow, today, more people were killed, more white people killed white people today than died in this terrorist attack. But we're not going to be talking about that tomorrow. We're going to be talking about the terrorist attack because we don't expect that to happen. We don't expect terrorism to happen to innocent civilians in broad daylight. We don't expect 
people with terrorist ideology to kill innocent people, innocent civilians. We expect people in domestic situations to there to be violence, there to be homicide. We expect there to be drunk driving. Do we believe it's okay? No, we understand that drunk driving is a national crisis, but we're going to give more attention to something like this, something like a terrorist attack. Or let's say, take Ray Rice, for example, when Ray Rice punched his wife in the elevator. If that was, if that was Ray Rice's wife and Solange battling it out, it wouldn't have been a big deal. It would have just been two girls fighting. But here you had Ray Rice, a man with an enormous amount more power than his wife, putting weight behind his foot and punching his mm. wife in the elevator. Mm. So when you have a situation where agents of the state and people who have been empowered by the government to protect and serve are killing innocent civilians and getting away with it with impunity, which we know black people, when we kill somebody, we go into jail, right? As my man said, you go into jail now. We go to jail. <laughs> police officers when they I think of the 1100 homicides that, or, or I should say police shootings that took place they can only account for like 47 of those actually being indicted and of the 47 that were indicted only like 30% of them actually were found guilty so it's virtually impossible to find a police officer guilty of homicide I mean, even in the Walter Scott case where he shot the man running away and then planted a gun next to him, the man, there was a hung jury. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, yep, so yep. It, it, that is why the inequity and the, 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 the unjust use of power, which is not only a threat to communities, but it also sends a symbolic message that the government themselves value a certain group of people less than others. And it also brings back the trauma of the historical oppression that black people experienced in this country. And that's why it stands out so much more to us. Yeah, yeah that, was, that yeah. was powerful, brother. Um, yeah, definitely. What I'll say is they're, 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 they're apples and oranges. Um, the average black person is not paid to protect and serve. All right. Like you're mm. like Cliff said, you're talking about people who are paid. Their very jobs are to protect and to serve the citizens of the United States. And so when you have them killing citizens of the United States unjustly, that is a heinous crime. And that is why there's so much attention on that. Now, that said, I do think we as African Americans need to focus more um, on, I don't mean more than on the police killings necessarily, but we need to focus more on the violence and trying to stop the violence that's in our community. You know, I, I would like sure. to see a group like Black Lives Matter because you can do both. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It doesn't have to be I only focus on the police killings of unarmed black men or I only focus on the black on black violence in our communities. You can address both. And that's what we need to do. Um, I like to, the people I've heard say all black lives matter, you know, so that's mm -hmm. the black lives that are killed by policemen and the black lives that are killed by black people or any person or in those the matter too. So I, I would like to see us address all of the black senseless, the senseless black killing that is taking place, whether it's us doing it, police doing it. And I, everybody might not agree with this. I would throw in. The black lives in the womb, you know, the the, right. the abortion, the abortion of black babies, you know, who are mm -hmm. defenseless. And so I think from the womb to the tomb, no matter who pulls the trigger, we have to address all of the issues uh, that are killing black people in this country. I just want to add in, too, man, I think that, um, you know, any movement that's that's going to really affect sustainable change over time, I think you have to give it time to, to mature. I think you have to give movements time to mature. You know, so whereas, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, 
I'll be honest with you. I don't agree with with much of you know what they stand for. You know, when you look on their website, I mean, I'll put that I, out there. I have I no problem saying that. You know, what I mean, I particularly agree with in regards black to the lives family. Matter. That's what I. Agree I re- yeah, with, I agree but, with the sentiment that black lives that matter. You know what I'm tenets, saying? Yeah. And anything that's centered around preserving you know black lives in terms of that sentiment, I agree with. Now that being said, it, it could be that the starting point of bringing this this uh, movement together is the police brutality. But one thing you want to do is you would hope that you have leadership that is able to take all of that energy and then see it mature into something to where we do, you know, uh, bring about action in regard to abortion or, you know, uh, black on black crime and those type of things. But I think it's a matter of allowing movements to mature because Chris, I mean, you, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, first of all, I mean, since 19, since 1973, you know, 17 million black babies have yeah. been aborted in the womb. We're a disproportionate you know, think about it. Now, percentage of our population, yeah, it's about yeah, one third yeah. of all, but all that's, abortions, those are right. black lives. And the thing of it is, who that could have been the black next lives. LeBron James, it could have been the next Barack Obama, it could have been the next Harry Absolutely. Tubman, yeah. who, you know, who was killed. But, but here, right. let me let me push right. back. I mean, when you think about it too, it's like you know, right now, I mean, there's only about thirty six million black people in 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 America right now, mm. you know, and so that means that as much as I, I'm against you know, police brutality, the reality is police officers would have to line up and gun down half of the current black population just to catch mm. up to how many oh, abortions God. we had of our own. Now, with that said, I'm not saying that one is more valuable than the other, you know, or one is more pressing than the other, or however you want to put it. My whole point is in the same way that I'm not going to, if you know, right now we're in Cancer Awareness Month. Now I'm not gonna run up to some NFL player wearing pink shoes and be like, "Nah, dog, you know people yeah, die yeah, from AIDS yeah. too." You know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to stand for that, then stand for that. But then we're also gonna have, we also need people on yes. different fronts. You see what I'm saying? We need people who are on different fronts with the same sentiment that Black the Lives abortion, Matter the affecting change in different ways. Without getting too far off, is a is a holistic conversation. I mean, look, let's be honest. White people, they aren't any more moral or put together than we are. I mean, as in fact, you know, in our community, well, look, I'm not going to go there, but but we are, they're, they're no more moral and they definitely ain't having less sex than we are, but they're having fewer abortions because their communities are intact, they're economically stable, and they're, they're, they're getting married and having children within wedlock. So, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's not just a straight line conversation because the reality is the high disproportionate amount of abortions in our community is not just a lack of morality, it's also a lack of economic resources, which is the main reason why people have abortions, I mean, or don't have abortions. Well, so, I, now let me come back on it, because first of all, I want to clarify, I never said there was an issue of morality. I'm just saying that it's an issue. And I, and I agree with you that it's multifaceted, you see what I'm saying? But for, but for that reason... In my personal opinion, I think that it needs to be right there with our current protest because you're right. It bleeds into so many other things. Yeah, I'll, get, I'll take it even further. I mean, we think about 17 million potential lives. I mean, think about the voting power mm-hmm. that, that's that's there. I'm saying that we've lost based upon having aborted ourselves out well, of political your, relevance. Your, I mean, there's so many different ways that point. it affects us. Go ahead. And I go think, ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Are you well, saying no, I just our think experience that it, it affects would be better us. if those 17 million? I think that's hypothetical conjecture. I mean, I think that wow. how's that you hypothetical? Know, we, we could have that's a conversation. Those 17 million because, people that I were mean, killed. Look, if our look, it's 30 million. No, it's 30 million of us now, and our and we and a lot of us are still experiencing. what well, we might have. A, it should it should I be about say, double though. It should be about could, double. But Adam, I could say now again. I'm, I don't want to. The reason I'm saying I don't want to engage in the hypothetical because I could say we could have double the prison population. I could say we have double the unarmed people being killed. Like the problems we have that are leading to abortion are the issue. Again, I'm not saying don't talk about it, but I do think it's you need to talk about it in context and acknowledge because think about the people that are hearing it. You know what I'm saying? Like when they talk about abortion, because think about it, the people that are really preaching to us about abortion Many of them are conservative and white. Now, okay, right is right, wrong is wrong. But, but many, many times blacks speak... talking about it too. Okay, I mean, that's, but, it, but it, hold on, to it's a hold on, issue. it's a lot of blacks talking about it too. Um, I mean, the Nation of Islam talks about it. Louis Farrakhan, they, they talk about it. You know, um, when when abortion first started or when it was trying to gain momentum to become legal, Jesse Jackson was against it. Jesse Jackson called it genocide. Most blacks at the time thought it was a genocidal plan 
to limit the black population. And now, I, again, I'm not saying let's only focus on abortion. I think you're right, totally right, right Cliff, right, that right. there are economic issues that lead to the disproportionate numbers of black abortions, just like there are economic and educational issues that lead to the disproportionate amount of black on black violence. So all of it is all of our problems for the most part as African Americans are very much related to our economic and educational challenges sure, and, and, sure. and obstacles that we face in this country. So we're agreeing with you there, but all I'm saying is, you know, a lot of blacks who agree with abortion today did so because they sold out to the democratic party because Je like I said, Jesse Jackson and many others thought abortion and stated that abortion was genocide against black people. And to this day, a lot of black militants, including uh, the Nation of Islam, and, speak and, out against yeah, abortion. And I, I mean, right, and I just, just want to clarify, too. I, yeah. Who's that? No, nah, I mean, we just disagree there. I'm not talk, I'm not arguing the What's morality the or lack of... I don't. Think, I mean, I don't think that. I don't think that they sold out to the Democratic Party. You may, maybe people did. like Jesse Jackson did, but the women didn't sell out to the Democratic Party. Most of them started doing it because it was economically convenient. I mean, let's just be real, and it was medically safe. So those. I'm are the talking two about why, why it became legal. Oh, okay. Okay, you know, I'm different. talking about I blacks. That, I didn't that, know that's where you were coming. I'm talking from. about blacks that began to stop the genocide talk it. and all that. The political, and, the and political then be, influence became supportive of it. That's and then I'm, I'm gonna add this too. I mean, honestly, in the same way, and in, in, in Chris, I mean, uh, Cliff, to your point, I agree with you that the abortion issue is a multifaceted issue. It totally, gets into totally. economics and all this kind of thing. But I can make the same argument about police brutality, though. I could argue that the reason why we're vulnerable to, you know, these, you know, these issues that we are in a, in a, in a bad spot in regard to economics, in regard to the, the amount of control that we have over our, our own community. So either way we go, you know, we're dealing with multifaceted issues. All I'm saying is that, you know, if we have, if, you know, uh, police brutality is a great starting point. It's something that needs to be addressed. But my hope is that, you know, it won't be like how we do with politics where, you know, cats voted for, you know, Obama and then dipped out for four years and then showed it back up at the polls and then dipped out again. And like nothing happened for like eight years to the degree that people wanted to see it happen. You see what I'm saying? Like we can't just be in and out of the movement. We need to take yeah, this energy that. and apply it in different fronts. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Such that, that we see comprehensive change. I just think I hear through a certain lens and a certain ear. And all I'm saying is, you know, with something like that, you know, we need to be you know, we're talking about 17 more million children coming into the world and dealing with the kind of issues we're talking about right now. So all I'm saying is, yes, you're right. We can t we should talk about it. But all I'm saying is let's talk about it in context and let's try to make sure that the 17 million children that we want to be here come into a world where they experience equality. You know what I'm saying? Come into a world where they actually experience economic equality because that's the primary reason that we're seeing what we're seeing among But I would rather than be here. Yeah, I rather and, still and, be and, in and the potentially world. and potentially <laughs> at least potentially affect change in those in those regards, but but right now they're not here. Even you if they, they, they can't even, world, yeah, that's even true, if they come into a world, they, not, they didn't even get a chance. You in a world, a you in a world that's not fair, but you here, and I'm sure you're I'm, glad you here. But I also, but I also grew up in a two parent home, and look, here's the reality. But you know, a dude, most, a dude that grew up in the hood with a one parent home, I'm sure he's still that, happier. He's here. That's easier. Look, we're getting. That's easy for us to say, but what I'm saying is, for a single mom who finds herself in that situation. I know, you know, my sister unfortunately had abortion. I advised it not to happen. But being vulnerable and being in that position, we don't know that feeling. And I guess where I'm coming from is the when I just when men sit around and talk about this issue and we we say it in just kind of a straight line without context, I think I hear it. And I just try to add context to the discussion. Not that I'm saying it's right. All I'm saying is I like to hear it discussed in a more holistic fashion as opposed to, and maybe again, I'm projecting on you, Adam, what I hear out there and the mm. noise that I hear where it's like, oh, we're killing babies, baby killers, baby killers. And there's no compassion. There's no context for the discussion. And so I think sometimes I may have, in this case, I may have projected those views onto you or those sentiments onto you. 
and kind of spoke that that into the discussion. But I just think, you know, the tone of our conversation is what I'm what I'm after more than anything else. Well, let me let me say this before we move on. I, and and this is to your point. I think what we have to do, and I say this carefully, I think that we have to reclaim certain um, talking points from the conservative side of the discussion. Thank you. And what I mean by that is many times, and this too, and, and and I feel where you're coming from, Cliff, many times when people talk about abortion or what about abortion is used as a battering ram against people you know who are maybe proponents of Black Lives Matter or are on the political left and so on and so forth. And because it's used as that battering ram so often, it is easy to hear it in, in that sort of a way when independent of where conservatives stand it is it is the case that abortion is a very serious issue that we ought to you know I put agree. an action plan in place and get it taken care of. That. And I think that what we have to do is we have to reclaim some of the things that uh, conservatives uh, and maybe not just conservatives, but people who speak against in opposition to the black community. We we need to reclaim some of that and then take hold of it, take responsibility, and then approach it in a way that that benefits our community. If, if, if that makes sense. Let me let me yeah. try to put yeah. a bow cool, on cool. it because I, I I think both you guys made great <laughs> points. Um, yeah. Cliff, you're absolutely right. You want to talk about it in the context. Everything is important to be talked about in context, but at the same time, we don't want to justify these, you know, the murder of, of, of innocent unborn children. Um, I think all of these, whether it's abortion, whether it's police killings of unarmed African Americans or unarmed people, and whether it's black on black crime and violence, they're all separate issues. Um, but they all involve black lives mattering. And so I'm not saying that the people, th there should be some of us that focus on each, each one of these issues, you know, but those groups, those, those blacks who choose to focus on trying to stop abortion, those that focus on trying to stop police killings of unarmed blacks, those that focus on black on black crime, you can focus on your own issue. However, at the end of the day, they should all be able to come together and work together, come together sure. and be supportive of each other. If indeed black lives matter, because at the end of the day, every single one of them is trying to help black lives. And right. so that right. that's that's what I think. You know, now coming around to it, you know, um, Edwin Raymond discussed some of the, the things that he believes would be beneficial in terms of criminal justice reform. And I kind of want to open it up to you guys as well. You know, what are some ways the criminal justice system can be reformed? Uh, would you, would you say? I'm gonna throw that at Chris first. I'm coming at <laughs> I mean, you. Coming I, at I, you. I, yeah, obviously that's a, that's a tough question. Um, the community policing needs to be encouraged where police officers are in the communities and, can even develop relationships with the people. Obviously, you need improved racial and cultural sensitivity training. And I think the history of the police office, the police department and the African-American community needs to be a part of this training. So I think that police officers need to be trained in the academies on the negative relationship that has existed between the two groups. So like the Jim Crow era, when blacks were arrested for and sent to prison for things like vagrancy, not having a job for congregating <laughs> together for, you know, things like that, like I that needs to be addressed to be because unemployed. then I think people will understand cops would understand why African-Americans right. feel a certain way about the police department. And, you know, I think that that could help. Um, I mentioned yes. the war on drugs. Um, I think that they, they need further reform of the Fair Sentencing Act, where they're still, even though President Obama, you know, lowered the ratio of crack to cocaine or cocaine to crack from 100 to one, you know, I think it, he lowered it to 18 to one, you know, but it still, it should be one to one, you know, and because they're the same exact substance, you know, crack and, and powder cocaine. But whites tend to use powder cocaine more and blacks tend to use crack cocaine more. So that that discrepancy needs to be, you know, done away with. Um, I would say, you know, I, I, I at one point I thought that when you have police misconduct that you needed to bring in federal prosecutors to investigate rather than uh, local prosecutors, because local prosecutors are so much 
in bed with the police department. Um, but the federal prosecutors don't seem to have much of a better record. But I do think that situation needs to be cleaned up where maybe you do bring in federal prosecutors, but you make sure it's that they're not in cahoots with the police force. Because in, in most cases, they don't prosecute police officers either for misconduct. Um, I also think there needs to be a national discussion and an independent study on the morality and the ethics of the private prison industrial complex. Because I believe firmly that privatized prisons are immoral. I mean, we talk about, you know, crime pays and benefiting from crime. The, the little, right. the smallest criminal on the streets is benefiting from crime, right? Crime pays. But the dude who builds the private prison, the corporation that builds the private prison is also profiting off of crime. And yeah. they all, most <laughs> right. of those contracts have clauses in there where if the prison isn't 80 to 90% full, then the taxpayers will make sure that they, like if it's 70% full, then that extra 10% or 20%, whatever's in the contract, is going to be paid by taxpayers. You know, that's immoral. And right. it's immoral to set up a situation where people have an incentive to lock people up. If you have a private prison and you need to have 80% capacity, then yeah, whether yeah. there's crime or not, you want people arrested and put in your prison. That's immoral. Yeah. What if they're, right. you know, and, and it also can lead to government or, you know, creating a situation where maybe that's incentive for them to make sure people don't have their needs met in the community. And if they don't have their needs met, then what are they going to resort to? Crime. Mm. And then they get locked up. So private prisons are immoral. It's as immoral as the cat on the corner selling drugs to his people. And there needs to be an independent study on that, a national discussion on it, because I think that would end a lot of, you know, problems that are going on as well. So those are a few of the things. And and then, of course, Sergeant Raymond talked about broken mm -hmm. windows policing. So all those right. things, I think, need to be addressed. Mm, bars. Where you at, Cliff? What you think, man? Man, um, I could. I don't got to say nothing else. Um, <laughs> right, you know, Chris right. drove it home, but I would say, you know, first of all, um, I mean, look, I hate to say it, but we need a new administration. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, mm. Jeff Sessions, they definitely are trying to roll back a lot of the progress that Obama made, and and actually, my um, my. He, he's my uncle by family, Charles Ramsey. You know, he's not my blood uncle, but, you know, we call, you know, my dad's best friend, Charles Ramsey, he was the chief of police in Philly and, and D.C. But they, they piloted the body cam program, and that has seen a decrease. We have they've actually seen progress from that program. It's seen decreased shootings as a result of the body cams, and we know that's something that the current administration wants to roll back. So, I mean, that's at a macro level. But here's here's a thought that I have. You know, Adam, you're a social worker. And one of the things mm -hmm. that trips me out is that in a lot of these police killings, you'll notice there are mentally ill people involved a lot of times. Sure. Why do you have police officers showing up with guns in tow we're, we're in a situation where, granted, people's safety may be at risk, so you obviously want pe police officers on site, but you have police officers showing up without mental health professionals, so you're asking police officers to be social workers, psychiatrists, and cops. These brothers, most of them only got a high school diploma. You understand? Most of them don't even go to college. So mm. you're asking them to operate way outside of their pay grade. And there's no wonder that a guy who's mentally ill, some of them, a lot of times military veterans may be suffering from PTSD. They got a knife in their hand and they take one step toward the officer, the officer 20 feet away, and he put 15 bullets in them. I mean, this kind of stuff mm -hmm. happens all mm -hmm. the time. Sure, That sure. is unnecessary. Interesting. That is unnecessary. You need a mental health professional on site that's able to communicate with somebody like this. These officers don't know how to talk or deal with a certain segment of the population that they interact with 
every day, including black people. So I think there needs to be a interdisciplinary approach created mm. in police departments where you have uh, social workers that are hired by the police department to work on site and address certain emergencies that come up and accompany the police. Those are the kind of forward thinking policies I would like to see put in place. Um, and of course, in addition, you know, uh, the, the, um, what Evan Wayne was talking about in terms of changing the, getting rid of broken window police. And that increases a lot of these interactions that they're having with, with black people. But that would be my one sort of forward thinking, um, um, you know, reform that I'd like to see in addition to the body cams, uh, not being, not being stopped. I mean, cause the, the body cams can be cut off and you notice a lot of times officers cut the body cam off when it's really about to go down mm. and they don't have, and they don't have to submit the footage if they don't want to. So I would like to see increased transparency and, and more strong arming, uh, of transparency when it comes to the body cams. So, I mean, think yeah. about why would, why wouldn't you want body cams? Right. Even right. Larry like, Elder right. wants body cams. Yeah. Larry Elder wants body I mean, cams. He, he said I mean, even Larry on. Elder. It's unbelievable. That tells like, you all you need to know. Nah, it's it's crazy. I mean, right. yeah. Well, I mean, no, I mean, what you said was fascinating too, uh, Cliff. I, I I never really thought about it, but um, to your point about the um, the mental health professionals taking an interdisciplinary approach to police, yeah. and I think that's fascinating. And in other areas of the criminal justice system, they do have that. I mean, obviously in the prison system. You do right. have mental health staff on site. I mean, they, and I know for a fact that they, because I, I tried to get a job <laughs> doing that, uh, where you do intervene, you know, two guys are scrapping it out and that kind of stuff. You do want to have somebody who can speak to the mental health issues that might be at play. And so it's, it, it almost kind of makes me think about how, like, you know, in the military, where you might have a press person who's embedded with a particular regiment, uh, you could almost have like a, a mental health uh, staff embedded into you know, right. a, a particular police They're regiment on who's They're on call on and ready to respond yeah. when uh, exactly. there's evidence that something like that is going on. That's that's pretty fascinating. That's I never thought about right. it. You know, um, that's, that's powerful stuff. Well, I'm going to throw this in there, too. I mean, just kind of throw my little two cents in is um, culture, man. I tell you, you know, police culture, it seems to me oh. that there has to be a retraining, uh, reprogramming, so to speak. And and I think that what happens is just just naturally speaking. I think that, you know, officers, in a sense, they have to develop a mentality that no matter what happens, we we are going to make it home. It's just like the military. You know what I'm saying? It's like this this unit, this bond. And I get that. But I think that it, it can come to a point where it turns toxic, you know. And what I mean by that is, and I think back to uh, the case that you mentioned earlier with Officer Slager. I mean, Officer Slager guns down, um, you know, Walter Scott eight times in the back. Boom. He's, you know, he's gone. And it appears that he planted a taser on Walter Scott's dead body while an African-American officer is sitting right there. You know, now, to me, that's where it it transcends black and white and it becomes about blue. It becomes about that blue line. And on on one level, I understand. I understand that you want to protect your colleague and it's us versus them. I, I, I understand how that mentality can develop. But when it gets to the point where it's driving you to do unethical things or to let unethical things slide, then it has become a problem. It has begun to cut against the very mission for which you are employed and are supposed to be serving the people. And so I think that we have to have, you know, officers like, you know, like Edwin Raymond have to feel empowered to speak against coworkers, colleagues doing the wrong thing. They have to be empowered to do that. It's not about, you know, you're a rat or you, you done, you know, whatever other term that somebody might use. It's about, we are here to serve the people. We're here to ensure that people are safe. And no matter what that means, no matter who has to take a fall, whether on our side or somebody else's, you know, then that's just what it is if, if, we, if we're about this mission. And unfortunately, it seems to me that, um, and I don't even know what needs to happen with that. Maybe it needs to be more of a community outcry about it, but officers need to feel empowered that they can speak up against, you know, wrongdoing. And not be penalized for it, you know, uh, yeah, within their I mean, department. It goes back to what I said at the beginning, you know. Yeah, it, it's gonna have to be the community because you got to remember, man. It ain't just on the job. They going back to a whole community that you know is is not really trying to have that. So Edwin Raymond goes home, and we like, yo, thank you for speaking up for us. They go home, and they like, yo, why you why you flipping on us? 
Right. You know, like why are you speaking up for them? You know, so it's not just on the job; it's in the community, and I and I and um, yeah, it's going to take a a cultural man. That's that's a big problem you just threw out there, but it you know it takes people just fighting, you know, over a long period of time and gradually changing attitudes. Absolutely, know? absolutely. So, so. I say. I should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're conscious on this. Y'all we're, brothers we're, dropping okay. knowledge. I feel you. I feel you. I feel and y'all you. some Christians too? Dropping knowledge? <laughs> <laughs> I thought y'all just read the Bible all day. I thought y'all just. <laughs> nah, man. Hey, that's all right, man. Well, you know, we once, I always enjoy like having Chris, y'all brothers man. on, man. Great discussion. And of course, for all the listeners out there, glad you were able to enjoy the show with us. Uh, make sure you go over to iTunes and subscribe to the King Talks podcast. Give us five stars, leave a comment, and share this episode with somebody else. Also, if you want to learn more about the King Movement, be sure to go to kingmovement.com and feel free to join our online community with no cost or commitment. As always, to the listeners out there, strong in the Lord. of the Lord, dying over streets when God gave him the earth, it's all in the Bible, just do your research, white man's religion, that's just fake news, the cross hit Africa for Europe even new, this ain't black versus white, this is dark versus light, but racism might distract you from the Christ on sight, so